Hi, uh, my name is Sandy Baird, and thank you all for being here to discuss this very important subject of the overturning of Roe v. Wade, which happened a couple of days ago when the Supreme Court announced that that precedent of Roe v. Wade, which was established in 1973, uh, was no longer uh, good law, that it had been overturned, and that the question of abortion and women's rights was going to be returned to the states and would not be part any longer of the fundamental rights of women throughout the United States. Um, so tonight I wanted to begin the discussion. It's a very long discussion and we're gonna continue it also on the 13th. So thank you all for coming, but tonight I will start and then we're going to hear from Kurt Maida, who's a constitutional scholar and also Justine Snow, a former student of mine, a public defender in Florida and also an expert on Roe v. Wade. I'm going to begin by talking about the original reasons that Roe v. Wade was put in place in the first place in 1973. Um, and I have the arguments that were presented at the time. In fact, I have um, a, both a tape of that hearing in which the court was asked to decide the fate of women's rights. I have a tape of it, but I also have a written version. At that time, uh, there was a young female attorney, Sarah Weddington, who argued the case that, um, that the right to an abortion as many other women's rights, many other women's rights in order to have children as well and have as many children as she wanted, was, fundamental, was a fundamental right that was in the United States Constitution. I'm always surprised that when when the, uh, the opposition to Roe v. Wade talks, they're talking as if it's that the Constitution has to say something like, the woman has a right to abortion. The court never did say that, they're quite right. The court did not say that a woman had a right to an abortion, nor did it say that a woman had a right to have a child. What they did say, however, and this, this is in the original argument that Sarah Weddington made to the court, after a couple stumbles, by the way, the court says to her, why, what, where is your constitutional basis for abortion as a constitutional right? And she stumbled around and then enunciated it's, it's in the 14th Amendment to the United States Constitution. Okay, what is the 14th Amendment? Um, and I'm talking about this because I think that the court in overturning Roe fundamentally ignored the, for, the 14th Amendment. The 14th Amendment was, was uh, established in about 1868. And the reason it was, was because black people had been slaves. They were emancipated during the Civil War. They had no real legal status at that time. Nobody knew what they were. Were they citizens? Were they property? And so the 14th Amendment says the following. All persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction there are, are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. No state shall make or enforce any law which abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of, person of life, liberty, or property without the due process process of law. Sarah Weddington argued, therefore, that the person to be protected by the Constitution was the person that was born, okay? And that person, of course, is the pregnant woman in the case that we're arguing about. And because she is a born person, she has all the rights of the citizens of the United States. That means the due process of law, and that means essentially the right to make her own medical decisions in the privacy of her own conscience as well, as well as men have the right to make decisions about their bodies, women were entitled to the same protections. Since that, that so that's the 14th Amendment and that's what the original role was decided upon. I'm gonna let Kurt talk about and, and um, Justine talk about why that was overturned. My argument has always been from the beginning that this is a fundamental human right of women and men to bodily autonomy, we could call it that, 
or the right to make important decisions about the course of their life without interference of the state, politicians, or bureaucrats. That is the fundamental right of all persons born in the United States, are citizens of the United States, and are entitled to the equal protection of our law. That was what the original role was decided upon. I think that recently, however, okay, so we'll discuss that later, but I, then I wanna talk a little bit about the politics of this whole situation. I think that increasingly throughout this horrible period from 1973 to the present, that many people see the whole struggle between those who would, the court, which has denied rights to abortion, and they've argued, look at there's no abortion mentioned in the constitution. That's correct. That's correct. Nor is appendicitis, nor is, you know, a vaccines injections either. None of that is also mentioned. What is the purpose of the constitution is to protect the rights of citizens born in the United States or naturalized in the United States. That is a fundamental right that the court decided pertains to women. That's all gone now. And I think largely the argument against uh, a lot has been mistaken. I think that many, even pro-choice advo advocates have, have sort of not seen this as a fundamental human right. They've seen it as some right that a person, pregnant woman has to an abortion. No, she, because she's a citizen, because she's born, have the right to ask for constitutional protection of her fundamental rights to make her medical decisions on her own without the appearance of big shots from the government or big courts or big bureaucrats. It is her fundamental right, as it is the fundamental right of males to determine their medical best interests free and clear of the state. Okay, so I'm going to stop there for a moment, but um, because um, I'm going to, I wanted to mention, I want, of course, the others to talk also, because I want to know. Oh, so then the court made a, uh, another decision, which I did want to address. So the court, in denying this human right, returned the question to the state legislatures. Now they're arguing, including Tucker Carlson makes this argument every night, that that's democracy at work that a state legislature representing the people should be able to, um, to vote on this. You don't allow votes on fundamental human rights. If it's the right to speak, the right to uh, go to church or not to go to church, that's a fundamental human right outlined in our Bill of Rights. Nobody gets a chance to overturn them that by a vote. They don't even Human rights do not get voted on. They are inalienable in our own wonderful words of the Declaration of in Independence. These are human rights that no majority can deny you. So that's the two elements, but the court got away with, with this decision because they basically because they wanted to is what I think. But anyway, so maybe we'll turn it to Kurt and then and Justine or the other way around, because I would love to know Kurt's legal analysis and Justine's legal analysis of what happened, but maybe we should start with Kurt. Kurt Maida, who is a colleague of mine, an attorney and a legal scholar who has a practice here in Burlington. Go ahead, Kurt. Okay, so Sandy, uh, thanks for having me and thanks for doing this program uh, this, this evening, depending on when, you, when you're watching it. Uh, I mean, you know, a couple of things that are important to note, I mean, strictly from the decision as far as the legal reasoning, you know, then we, you know, as you mentioned, we'll, you know, we'll talk about politics later, because uh, yeah, I think, I think they're inseparable in this, in this context. But, uh, you know, the, the case that, uh, the, the seminal case that allowed women to exercise this fundamental right, as you uh, stated it is, was, uh, was Roe v. Wade, which was decided in 1973. Mm -hmm. And what, uh, what the court decided, and, uh, and Roe came after a string of cases uh, in the, the mid-1960s, mid late 1960s, 
uh, that uh, that relied on the 14th Amendment, as you mentioned, Sandy, uh, specifically with respect to something called uh, substantive due process. Right. Sub substantive due process, uh, uh, you know, I'm going to try not to make it too boring here, but uh, sub substantive due process, uh, you know, the way the court looked at it were rights that were unenumerated, which means weren't specifically listed in the Constitution that the court felt that they needed to protect. So what Sandy mentioned a couple of moments ago, uh, you know, as fundamental rights, she referred to things like freedom of speech, freedom of worship, you know, going to the church or wh wherever you go to pray, uh, to assemble, uh, you know, uh, to publish. Uh, you know, these are enumerated rights in that the Bill of Rights, the first 10 amendments to the US Constitution specifically mm -hmm. mention these rights, you know, thus they are enumerated uh, and those are protected. The, you know, the, 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 fifth amend, the fifth amendment to the constitution uh, basically guarantees that the federal government won't take any action mm -hmm. that will limit these rights. And part of the 14th amendment, aside from the connotations that it had with respect to the end of slavery, that also guaranteed those rights uh, as to the states. Because prior to 18, uh, and I'm guessing uh, 1868, when right. the 14th Amendment was, uh, was, was in fact uh, added to the Constitution by amendment, uh, what people had to do in order to uh, protect themselves from government intrusion when it comes to uh, some of the enumerated, the listed rights in the Constitution, free respect, press, religion, speech, is they had to largely rely on um, on state constitutions themselves, as right. well as well as state laws, uh, because the the you know when, if they went to a federal court, federal court said, well, the Fifth Amendment, you know, that only guarantees the the federal government right. from uh, not taking action. Uh, so let's let's kind of move back to the uh, present here. So the 14th Amendment uh, in the late 1870s, uh, there was a dissent by a Justice Field in something called the Slaughterhouse Cases, which established this concept of uh, uh, substantive due process, which are fundamental rights, as Sandy mentioned, that weren't specifically uh, mentioned in the Constitution that needed to be uh, needed to be protected and preserved. For the American people. So let's fast forward from there to 100, 100 years later. And in the late 1960s, there was this notion of a, of a right to privacy mm -hmm. as a substantive due process right that the justices in the 1960s court, uh, uh, Supreme Court, felt was necessary to protect. And then they felt that that was a fundamental right. So you had things like uh, contraception uh, that was legally guaranteed then uh you know for unmarried people oh they, married people only in, wasn't it in the late 60s prior to prior yeah. to yeah the case the big case uh with respect to con contraception was Griswold versus Connecticut uh you know and then you had right to marry cases and then of course you know the the big case in our discussion today Roe which said that you know essentially uh that not that abortion is protected but a woman's right to an abortion because of her of her fundamental privacy rights to make a decision as to you know what she wants to do with respect to child rearing in that whether to have children or not that was protected by her right to privacy and what the court basically uh, in Dobbs the current case that overruled Roe was stating is that um, that essentially there is no protected right to privacy with respect to abortion. Mm -hmm, you know? right. and, 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 you know, a 5-4 majority in, in, the, in the court ruled against Roe, overturned Roe, overturned Casey, a 1992 case, which, um, which further defined Roe's entire concept with respect to the trimesters as to when uh, when a woman would be allowed to uh, exercise her right to an abortion and when the government could, in, in fact, you know, pass intrusive laws. Right. The, case, the, the 1992 Casey case 
broke out, broke up the, uh, the concept of trimesters and talked about fetal viability. Right. And that was, you know, basically assessed as six months, 24 weeks, but subject to change. Hey, can I uh, correct? I think that the vote though was six to three. Six to three with respect to the uh, Mississippi statute. Right. Uh, but in terms of overturning Roe, it was a little closer. It was one closer, it was five, four. Wow. Everybody noticed today that Stephen Breyer resigned as of tomorrow. Did you yes. see that today? I saw it late afternoon. He must have been in the dissent, correct? He was, he was in the dissent. He yeah, stayed correct. in long enough. So he knew it was coming. He stayed in long enough to issue a dissent, and then he's off the court tomorrow at noon. Anyway, Justine. This is Justine Snow. As I mentioned, a student that graduated happily for me from Burlington College, except then she went away to Florida. She's a public defender in Florida, and she has thought about this issue many times. Justine. Hi, Sandy. Um, thank you for having me again. I always love joining on Wednesday nights, brings back good memories. Um, yeah, I mean, just backing up with Kurt says that's really what the opinion comes down to. It is a 213 page opinion. Um, just if you want some light reading. Um, essentially, what it seemed like the court went through is if it's not an enumerated right, they then decided, is it deeply rooted in our nation's history? And they go through that analysis and determine that the right to an abortion or abortion is not um, deeply rooted in our nation's history. And then they went through the history of the criminalization of abortion prior to Roe. Mm -hmm. And um, it seemed as though they were saying that was more deeply rooted um, or at least it supported that the right to abortion was not deeply rooted in the history. Um, one of the things to mention was that in one of the concurring opinion, opinions from Justice Thomas, who was also present on the court in the record with hetero not hetero opinion in Obergefell v. Hodges, which was the gay marriage case, um, he straight said in his concurring opinion that he also felt those cases were decided wrong and that those were not included in this um, right to privacy. And so that the Supreme Court should go back and correct those opinions as well. And so that's something to look out for in the future based on now this case being precedent to rely on for future opinions. Okay, with that, I might mention something else. I wanna read you something from the original argument of Sarah Weddington, because these, are, these were the enumerated rights that she did say were enumerated when it comes to the private matters of marriage and the family. She says, the court has in the past held that it is the right of the parents and of the individual to determine whether or not they will send their child to private schools whether or not their children will be taught foreign languages, whether or not they will have offspring. Remember the eugenic cases when they decided certain people couldn't reproduce? Um, and then the right to marry, which was the Loving case. Um, and in the Loving case, it overturned the laws in, I think, Virginia, which did not allow black people to marry white people. Anyway, these issues of marriage, the family and sex have all been considered as part of your fundamental rights to make these decisions yourself without the overbearing nature of the government and politicians. So that's where we stand. Let me just say one thing now about where it does stand. It does not mean at this point that abortion is criminalized. And by the way, I wanna ask a question. When you're talking about criminalizing abortion, what has been the case before Roe was there was only one part, one party that ever was criminalized in an abortion case. That was the doctor. A doctor here in Vermont, up until 72 in a Vermont case, the doctor could not perform an abortion. If a woman did it herself, there was no crime. That's when in Vermont, essentially that law against doctors was overturned. And therefore there was a vacuum in 1972, in the Jacqueline R case, there was virtually a vacuum because abortion was decriminalized, right? 
So, a, so at that point in Vermont, there were no laws against abortion at all. And, that, and it was in that vacuum that people like me and others, Sally Ballin, who's here, and other people formed the Vermont Women's Health Center and became the first legal abortion providing service in the country, I believe. Okay, so anyway, um, any thoughts, questions? Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, what Justine said towards the, you know, at the, the end of her piece, it's, it's really critical. I, you know, I know it may come across by some people as alarmist, but, uh, you know, and, and just to be clear about that is that uh, what Justine mentioned was that Justice Clarence Thomas, who, who, who wrote uh, a concurring opinion, specifically mentioned the, the possible need to revisit some of the other cases that were based on this substantive due process right of privacy that they need to be revisited. It's really important to remember the entire concept of substantive due process came about in the 1870s from a dissenting opinion mm -hmm. uh, in, in a case. Uh, so, I, you know, I know some people may poo poo the whole thing that, okay, well, we're not going to go back to you know, looking, uh, looking at, um, looking at contraception, or looking at, uh, you know, uh, the intimate lives of uh, people that are not heterosexual, or the right to marry, but it's not completely out of the realm of possibilities that we, we, we that the court could revisit some of these cases, right. if they're, if they're contending that that, that is badly decided law. Right, I, I understand that. I want to uh, focus though somewhat on the damage this has done to the lives of women and girls now, right this instant. The people most damaged by this is that women and girls can no longer make decisions about their pregnancies. Ready? Yeah, Eric. Jay, the doctor said, I thought he said before, but I think uh, Eric's muted. Muted. Can't hear him. Yes, I uh, I was uh, reading. Uh, I think it's a question from Jane, who said, uh, "Sandy, you said before, but I could be wrong that those not born yet are not considered citizens no, no, and right. don't have protections right. covered by the Fourteenth Amendment." Correct. Could you elaborate on? Yes, that? because fetuses are not born. They're not therefore defined by the 14th Amendment as persons, born persons uh, have the right to due process and the right to uh, be protected by the constitution. You're absolutely right. The fetus, the embryo inside a woman's body is not at this moment a person under the laws of the United States. There, Eric, I thought you had a question. Thank you. Or somebody else? No, so Sandy, I guess uh, just to kind of ask a, a question, where, where, where is this going? You know, a number of, state, number of states had passed trigger laws once uh, the, the, uh, uh, the last uh, Supreme Court justice was uh, appointed, Amy Coney Barrett. Uh, assuming that there was going to be a case that was going to go up the up, up the chain to the court that was going to that was going to overturn uh, overturn Roe, so I think that there were about 13 states that passed these trigger laws, which uh, essentially immediately put a you know a ban on abortions the moment Roe was uh, Roe was overruled. Uh, what? There's there's talk about the possibility of uh, criminalizing abortion yeah, right. and go for and, and thus you know resulting in a 50 state ban because I mean if the definition of an abortion is indeed murder then how can there be some wait a minute, wait a minute. okay correct I, I'm saying However, that how can how can some states allow it now some states you know won't so I mean where is this going I'll tell you what you're kind of hinting at what I think is going to happen is the same thing as it always was. The doctor will be criminalized. That's it. Yeah. 
I don't think there's anyone that I, although no, no, there are people who would criminalize the woman for having an abortion. That has never been the precedent in this country, never. However, these people are so intent on controlling women's bodies, they might in certain states pass a law that punishes the woman for doing an abortion by herself or by, by one of these pills. They might. I'm just going to talk about the status again of life before Roe and in Vermont before the, um, uh, the ja Sally, correct me, uh, Beecham versus Leahy, right? That's the name of that case, correct? Beecham versus Leahy. At that time, there was one person who committed a crime if they did an abortion, and that was the doctor. It was never a crime for a woman to do it herself. I believe they're going to go back to criminalizing the doctor. I don't even, even the most, uh, I think, whatever you want to call the pro, uh, uh, I don't know, I guess I have to say pro-life, but it, they're not, pro, they're not pro-life in my mind because they're not pro the life of women and girls. So Sandy, I do just want to jump in. Prior to Roe, there were four states that did criminalize women for abortions, um, Arizona, Delaware, Idaho, and Oklahoma. And from my understanding, some of the trigger laws in some of the states do criminalize women for um, seeking an abortion, attempting to seek an abortion, or getting an abortion. I think we should check that before we know for sure. Because I, I think know. that's the Texas law. No, the Texas law is a civil thing. It's not a crime anyway. The Texas laws that were passed uh, makes a person maybe liable for a lawsuit, a lawsuit for damages if they assist a woman at all in getting an abortion, but it's not really a crime for which a person could go to jail. It is a civil liability penalty that they could be sued for monetary damages. So it's pretty restrictive too but it's not yet a crime anywhere that I know of. I mean, it might've been before Roe in certain states, but that was not the case here. But the doctor was criminalized, which of course made women go crazy and find other ways to get abortions. And they died. It was the second mm -hmm. uh, cause of death of women. And obviously these, I don't know what to call these people, these anti-female women forces don't care about women's and uh, girls' lives, they care really only about the fetus. I mean, I can't, I can't see it any other way. Can anybody else? I don't think they really care about the fetus either. No, I know. I think they really want to control women's sexuality. I, I, and I do too. I absolutely do. But you know, for for them, for them to assert that uh, uh, abortion um, uh, is is didn't exist before there was a constitution I know. is totally ridiculous. Women have controlled their, their entire family and reproductive lives since the beginning of time. Exactly. And <laughs> thank heavens. And it's, yeah, that's, that's, I mean, to talk about, you know, traditional uh, tradition and uh, in being embedded in the, the national, in whatever their phraseology was for how long uh, abortion rights have existed. Uh, it, it never was a, a matter of public policy until fairly recently. And you know, the fact is, should it, I, we never asked this, it shouldn't be a part of public policy. It's a medical decision, period. And that should be done in the confidentiality between a woman and her doctor, pregnant woman and her doctor. So how, how do we argue that? And is there any point in arguing that? What is, what is the next step for? Why don't we talk about that? What is the next step? Sandy? Yeah. Robin has her hand up. Okay, Robin. But you're muted, Robin. Just wondering, um, the other day on Democracy Now!, Amy Goodman was talking about the 13th Amendment, not the, as well as the 14th. Right, but it and didn't the apply in the argument. It says neither slavery nor involuntary servitude. Right. Now you could, I would think, but not being a lawyer, I'm wondering what you guys think, involuntary, that being forced to have as many children as for, 
when you get pregnant is putting you into involuntary servitude. Can that argument be made? The unfortunate thing at the federal level, no arguments can be made now at all. It's done, it's over. We have to think about what we're gonna do about this on a local level. That's the only strategy I can think of. Anybody else have any ideas about that? I have a question. I have a question. Who is that? Am I on? Yep, 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 yep. So I, I think there's one part of this argument and um, I am pro, pro choice, but one part of this argument that we're missing is the idea that this pregnant person is killing a person. Right. And I, and I think a lot of the, the argument of the say pro-life people is, is, is a degree thing, you know, is the 12, the 12 week, the heartbeat thing, the 24 week, the viability thing, or all the way up to nine months. And a lot of the argument has been that people pushed it too far. And, and, and the whole nine month thing, it's hard to argue that you're not killing a person when you're nine months pregnant. And so that's, I think, one of the arguments of the people that are against abortion is, is that you're killing somebody. So, you know, what right do you have to kill somebody? So I'm, I'm stating that as a person that's in this pro-choice, but I think that's part of the argument that we're missing here. No, it's not, not in my mind, but other people, of course, can address that. The, pro the problem that you're arguing is, it's still a medical decision that has to be made by the pregnant woman. That's always my argument. Who would you trust to make that decision? Only the pregnant woman with her doctor. There's no sense in going into when is a, per when is a fetus a person. That's defined in the constitution, number one. But number two, even a late term abortion is a medical decision that has to be made in the privacy of a woman's conscience and her doctor. It's it, the, the question of that you're asking is a question that's always asked about you know, the development of the fetus, but it still is the, is the right of a woman with her doctor to make up her own medical and conscientious decision. It really, that's, it's over. There's sometimes when late-term abortion has to happen. But Sandy, isn't Pete's point valid in that, that he's uh, framing the argument from the other side? Sure and that's, that's, and that's why these, you know, for example, uh, you know, Roe delineated this very detailed uh, trimester Correct. scheme. And then Casey talked about fetal viability Right. And then, you know, I think about a year or two ago, there was this uh, statute, a state law passed by Texas called the Texas Heartbeat Act. Yes. Where Texas basically stated that if they could uh, detect embryonic activity or fetal cardiac activity at that point, uh, that was considered, quote unquote, a person. And the woman was, you know, not capable of making that decision on her own or with her doctor any longer. So, I mean, you know, I'm not, I'm not taking a side here. I'm just saying the other side is essentially stating exactly what Pete is saying that, you know, this, this is essentially killing a potential person or a person. We all know that. We all know the opposite argument. My argument is always going to be, it is a private matter between a woman, pregnant woman and her doctor. But that argument was never successfully made by our side. Nor was it effectively- But it should have been, it should have been. Nor was it at the federal level, was it ever codified uh, yeah, you know, well, after, after Roe it was, you know, we always relied on Roe as the precedent, but then there wasn't any kind of statutory framework at the federal level that was passed to protect that right. It didn't need to. Yeah. Well, didn't need I to. think that, well, I mean, look, I mean, you know, if you look at the context of civil rights, you know, the 13th, 14th and 15th amendments were pretty, uh, you know, pretty explicit on what that meant. However, you still had the Civil Rights Act of 1964. You had the Civil Rights Act of 1968, which put in further protections to, to buttress those 13th through 15th right. amendments. 
So why wasn't something similarly done? I have no idea because at that point, the court had decided that it was a fundamental human right of women and girls to make that decision in their own conscience. They are moral agents. They are capable, rational human beings. Those are the only people, women and girls involved in this decision. And that's what they decided in Roe. And they merely overturned that right and disempowered women all over this country. And I don't where's, know. Where's this, where's this going now? Ask the audience. I think we need to hear from the audience. Where do you think it's going? Sandy, Jane has her hand up. Oh, okay, Jane? Yeah. Yes, yes, thanks. Yep. What I wanted to say, if you consider, a, 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 I think that the that argument about the fetus being considered considered a human being is very pertinent because because of because if you allow abortions, then you can allow people, then you can allow people to kill anybody that they want to, they, by allow by allowing abortions of a fetus as a person and a, and a fetus as a protected, and it's and then it gets into the absolute right for right to life we don't have an absolute right uh, an absolute right to life uh, obviously since we go to wars at the drop of a hat right you're right and we have the death penalty uh, and then but then jane makes an important point you know another substantive due process right that was up for discussion in the 90s was physician assisted suicide right and and they tried to get that in under the under the rubric of a right to privacy, you know, me making a private decision with my doctor mm -hmm. about you know, you know, suffering an immeasurable amount of pain and wanting to end that pain, so I should have that private right. Uh, however, that the court struck down that you know that option for people. One reason I think, I'm, I'm not going to get into it because I don't know the reasoning, but of course they struck it down because when you commit suicide, you, it's homicide and, yeah. it's, and it's punishable by law and it's the death of a person. The fetus is not a person. Right. But at the, but at the end of the day, both decisions have, you know, a element of Judeo-Christian thinking, morality behind right. them, you know, right. that this is killing. Right, you can't kill a person. I agree with that. You cannot commit homicide. I totally agree with that. You cannot commit infanticide either. You cannot kill people. So do you see any uh, prospect of, you know, and I know we have people on diff from different states, you know, on the call here, so forgive me, but do we see that the, uh, the right for women to make reproductive uh, choices uh, preserved in Vermont? Well, I, I think maybe we sh I could ask some of the people that I know, I'm involved in that struggle too, but there are people out here that are really more deeply involved, I think at this point, like Sally or Beth Sachs. So maybe, what are your thoughts about that? Mark has his hand up as well. Oh, and Mark, Mark Estrin, you mean? I don't, okay, fine. Mark, where are you? I'm unmuting. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Um, I wanted to get to the question of what are we going to do, right? If that's okay. Um, sure. And one of the things I think we can do and can easily do is create a public organization of people who will assist people who need to come to Vermont in order to get an, an abortion. So, for instance, you have a room that you can offer. You, for you know short term you have a you have a couch people can stay on you have a transportation um, that can be used locally or statewide and if there were such an organization that had a public face uh, the model that I'm thinking of is there's something called couchsurfing.org which is terrific um, and it used to be free to people who, who ha would open their houses if anybody or the traveler needed a place to stay. And uh, we uh, here did couch surfing on both ends and it's wonderful meeting people then, especially the kind of people who are willing to open their homes. And uh, so uh, I would suggest that even this group of what 15 people could uh, constitute 
a, uh, a, an open home uh, transportation system within the state for people who need to come here, stay for a while, get to, the, get to wherever they have to get. Okay, I think Eric wants to add something. Yeah, yeah. also what can we do? You know, uh, this uh, ruling will affect the uh, new American community. Uh, because also uh, most of them don't have access or don't know much about contraception. Because in this, so uh, they will, I mean, I, I don't have the figures, but I will suspect that abortion will be sometimes in, and, and you know, that I've seen that in Africa. So it could be replicated here as a way to do uh, uh, contraception. Right, right. So uh, as much as effort should be, you know, deployed to allow people to have access to uh, uh, to uh, an abortion, we should also, when it comes to the uh, uh, to the uh, new American community, emphasis. I mean, put an emphasis on contraception and you know means mm -hmm. to avoid going to that place where you can be. I also have a question which is technical. I mean, it's not, we, I'm pretty sure that the debate will evolve into what is a human being at which age. Yeah. I, that, because my daughter in France was, you know, I was able to recognize her when she was six months a fetus. Mm -hmm. She was a fetus six months, then I could go to the superfect à la prefecture to say, I, Eric Agnero, recognize Eloan, that being is not born yet. Is yours? Yeah, but I had, I was able to do a birth certificate in advance. Mm -hmm. That's, that's, you know, what you can do in France. It was very responsible of you as a father, too. <laughs> it was. Yes, but, you know, so uh, I'm pretty sure that we will evolve towards, like, the definition of what is a human being at which stage of the fetus you are considered, I don't know if, if uh, such a thing can be. No, uh, not under American law. A fetus becomes a person once it's born. Now that that's still part of the 14th Amendment. What the court said, however, was that none of that was pertinent. What the court said was that this is a, this is something that should be debated in legislatures. Well, I don't agree with that. I think that this was a fundamental right guaranteed to women and girls to make this decision. And the court obviously does not agree. So it's up to us to figure out, therefore, what next? What are we gonna do next? Justin has her Jean? hand up. Who? Justine. Justine has a comment. Yeah. So I just wanna go to, I think it was Mark's question about um, coming together and offering homes. First, I wanna say, um, as someone in a state where abortion is probably going to be very dangerous soon, that's a dangerous statement to make on a recorded um, system out loud. And I just want to explain why. Um, there are organizations nationwide that do that. They are called abortion funds. If you are looking to help people in that way, come to Vermont and get abortions. Um, you can join or donate to an abortion fund. You can go to abortionfunds.org. They are trained, they know how to move people secretly where these people are not later going to be criminalized or sued in their own states. Um, when abortion becomes criminalized in a state and someone leaves a state to get an abortion, there's a very high risk that they can later be criminalized, um, sued, there are bad legal consequences. So it is not um, safe to say in open forums such as this, let's all get together and help people who want to travel to Vermont get abortions. But there are ways to do that um, with people in organizations that have been preparing for this for years because they saw this coming. And that's abortionfunds.org. They will direct you to any in the area and they will tell you how you can assist. And so that's where I just want to direct people to that. Um, as far as what we can do next, I just wanted to touch on that. Each state is going to have different ways that they're approaching this. I will say in Florida, as crazy as we are, um, currently there are lawsuits that are being put in place because Florida has an express right to privacy in our constitution. 
And so Roe was decided under this right to privacy, Florida codified that in our constitution. And so currently we do have that protection for us right now. I don't know how long it will last um, because the Florida constitution can change a little bit easier than the federal one. But so I did just want to put that out there and that different states are going to, it's going to be a lot of state battles is what I see in the future because of the federal opinion. And the other thing I just wanted to point out is these three judges who were put in place were put in place by a president who wasn't elected by the popular vote. And so that's a concern is we have somebody who wasn't elected by most of the country who put someone in, who put three people in, who have now made a decision who affects the whole country. And so I think um, this is another, and not to get off topic, Sandy, but this is another reason to look back at the electoral college system. I, I, under, I understand that, but um, I honestly think, I really think it's too late to do much in the federal courts. I, I just do. I think we have to be looking at the local level on how to preserve. I mean, Ver, Vermont right now has, uh, hasn't it, Sally, hasn't it codified the right to uh, reproductive decision-making on the part of women and girls? Hasn't that been codified into the law? And isn't there um, talk of Prop 5, which will be a constitutional amendment? I think Sally or Beth maybe know that better than I do. Do you? Where are you? Well, I guess, I guess they don't, maybe. But I do know that there's going to be that, this, that the legislature last year passed a law which codified Roe at least into the law. I know also that there's Proposition 5, I think, which wants to make a constitutional amendment to the Vermont Constitution, which allows uh, women to seek abortions. I don't know if it's going to pass, though. I have no, I mean that's a different matter, right? I think uh, just thing to, just thing to clarify. What, Mark? Go I'd ahead. Like, well, I, I Justine was commenting on my uh, proto proposal here. Um, and I don't really understand, maybe you can clarify, supposing either I, uh, as a householder, or a group of us, we have 17 here, uh, became publicly open house to, uh, for, and for offering transportation and, and housing to people in need who come to Vermont for abortions. I don't understand what then with what the danger is, what would I be charged with? Aiding and abetting a crime? It's not a crime here, right? It's not a crime until it's federally declared a crime, which hasn't happened yet. And then supposing that happens next year, uh, can you be endangered by a, a, a law that was not in place when you um, committed your quote crime? So can you clarify that stuff? Yeah, absolutely. So you would not get in trouble because you're in a state that allows it. The woman who leaves the state where it's illegal or anybody who assists her can get in trouble. So and because we have this digital world where everything you say and everything you write on social media and your phone and everything is tracked, there's a, there's a digital trail to everything. And so if someone's living in a state where abortion is criminalized, and let's say, for example, either the woman is criminalized or anybody who is assisting her, which is the trend of a lot of the laws that are in place um, as of Friday, it's people who are assisting. So if I live in a state where abortion is illegal and anybody who helps me can be charged with a felony, like Alabama, and my friend drives me to Vermont and you have this post on, on Facebook or on here or on some type of social media that says, hey, anybody seeking an abortion in Vermont, we have a little underground railroad here, um, come stay at any of our houses. That's all online. So when my friend and I go back afterwards, they can trace that trail and use all of that in a prosecution of us or my friend or a civil suit of us because it's all out there. And that's why it's so important. And there's nothing wrong with wanting to help. And I think that's great. And I think it's gonna be so necessary for the next however long this is going on, um, that people are helping, that people are offering those resources, but it's important to do it through those organizations that have trained for this 
and that are prepared and know how to do this in a way where there's not going to be a trail and where people aren't going to be endangered legally um, or criminally in the state that they are coming from. And so that's where I hope that clarifies that. Who's, there's some people in the chat, I think, right? Or Pete? Or no, yeah. Pete, yeah. Um, th this is about Proposition 5 um, because we, we started talking about that. So in 2019, Vermont did guarantee women the right to an abortion. Proposition 5, although Vermont Digger recently wrote an article saying it was redundant, is not really redundant because it has very vague broad language that would basically allow anyone, male or female, to alter their reproductive systems at any age. And, and this is a problem because this, this isn't about abortion. This is, this is another thing that unfortunately is being promoted about um, children being allowed to decide or their parents even that at the age of 10 that they've been born into the wrong body and want to change their reproductive system and remove perfectly healthy body parts. So th this thing that's being voted on and, and the other thing, which I've read legal, legal, um, legal uh, uh, writings about, if the federal government decides to say that abortion is, is illegal, no matter what Vermont does in this constitutional bill, it, it, won't, it won't override what the federal government says. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Okay, so yes, that's correct. The so Proposition 5 is very vague. You have to read it. And unfortunately, it encompasses way more than just a woman's right to reproductive to, to an abortion. The 2019 law specifically stated abortion. The, the, the bill that we're voting on in the fall says it gives the right to any person um, to be able to decide, um, to get reproductive autonomy. And it doesn't have an age limit. So literally a 10 year old could say, yeah, I don't really want a uterus, so please remove it. And, that, and that's the, the unfortunate thing that I think this bill encompasses oh wait a minute can i correct you on one thing it's not a bill it's a it's a vote i believe on a constitutional amendment correct it's worse than a bill <laughs> well it would change the cons our, cons our vermont constitution. correct uh, sally did you have something to say yes i just wanted to point out another way in which it's not redundant a statute can be amended it can be changed it can be uh, uh, it, it, it's, it's not a permanent thing and another different legislature could, could uh, make it be completely different, make it be useless. The only way to really protect abortion rights is to have an, a constitutional amendment. Um, but I think the point that was just made about it's how broad it is, is uh, some is, is problematic as far as it actually passing this November. I think, goes. Okay, do you else have any questions or comments uh, right now? Yeah, I, I mean, I had a comment just to make. Uh, you know, I think if there is a government that is more, uh, I sh I'll say, you know, use the terms anti abortion that comes down the line, you know, at the federal level. I mean, they could incentivize states to limit access to abortion. I mean, if you think about, you know, how did we get to a drinking age of 21? It's not in the constitution, but the federal government get, doles out money to states to be part of this, you know, 21 regime, uh, having a speed limit of 55 miles per hour at one point the way they were able to do that was the, the, the federal government gave money to states uh, for highway funds uh, if they participated in that. So I think, you know, there is a possibility in the future that even our state, and I'm talking about Vermont here, could be in a position where they have to make a decision as to whether or not they want to keep abortion on the books or um, not accept federal money. In, uh, in, a, in a certain context. I mean, the federal government works that way all the time, incentivizing certain states to uh, conduct themselves in a certain way based on, based on money. 
But they don't, there's no money that the federal government gives, as far as I know, to assist abortion. No, 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 not to assist abortion, but to get rid of abortion. Oh, I know they could pass. Not right now, but I'm sa I'm saying further down the line, the government often gets you. you know states to act in a certain way that they want want them to act by incentivizing them or right. disincentivizing them. Right. Did you have a question, Eric? But the government said, I think I heard that on uh, on public radio that you know they will try to assist in which in some ways you know the states or the individuals in states that have trouble because they cannot i mean oblige the states to you know to be pro abortion so they will help i don't know well there's there's suggestions as to the federal government right now it's a democratic government maybe but it certainly it could change in, yeah. and probably will by the way in november probably it's my feeling at least based on evidence that the Democrats are not in great shape for November. So I think we very well could get a Republican Congress and maybe even a Republican state legislatures and Republican governors. It's a real loss on our part, but I don't know if we can depend on having um, pro-choice people that are going to have any power. I just don't think so. I don't know what anybody else is predicting, but what do we all think? Getting me back to though, I think that one, the only strategy that I can think of is to uh, do as much as possible to keep Vermont safe, to empower women and girls and boys to play good roles toward women. Um, and I think we have to have grassroots organizations that are pledged to that, pledged to creating, um, society where girls and women are valued, that they are trusted to make decent decisions about their futures and where, where we give them control to make those decisions in the best way possible for themselves, for their families and for the best of society. There's nothing that is more healing or healthy in our society than empowering girls and women to truly take part in the governing of our countries in the discussions around the environment, around the population, and making sure that women and girls have the ability to participate fully in society. And that means having control of the, over the number of children that they want and that they can afford and that does not hamper them for being full citizens and participants in our society. We can't allow this to happen. I don't think, but I, I think that there's only one solution and it's not the courts anymore. It's gonna to have to be in local level of places where are determined to empower women and girls. And I hope that's Vermont. Anyway, any, I, I think we're out of time, but we, I hope to continue this discussion uh, on the 13th. It's such an important decision. Um, and so, um, I would welcome you all to come back where we will discuss this further. Does anyone have any final thoughts on this subject or comments or predictions for the future? Anyone? How about you, Just Justine? I just want to add one more resource. Um, for those of you in Vermont, you probably don't need it at this time, but if we're talking about things going south in the future, um, no pun intended, uh, there are still male abortion pills available. You go on the website aidaccess.org and you can order male and abortion pills. You don't even have to be pregnant. You can just say that you are living in an area where you fear abortion is about to become illegal and they will mail you the abortion pill. Um, it's like a hundred dollars, but so that is out there as well in case anybody wants to stock up for any future doom. However, Justine, that's for only an early pregnancy, right? It is up to eight weeks. Yeah, okay. But uh, better than saline or... No, yeah. I agree. I, I totally agree. But they might try to criminalize that too, you know? And they certainly, by the way, would criminalize people who are practicing medicine without a license. So be very careful. Like they criminalize lawyers for practicing law without a license. So be very careful about giving out medical advice. Okay, anybody else have any final thoughts? Well, well, I mean, thank you all for joining us. And remember, we'll be with you again in a couple of weeks. Next week, we're gonna be discussing a more local issue. 
On the 6th, we're going to welcome Megan Emery, a city councilor from South Burlington, who will be describing for us the expansion of our airport and what the effects of that expansion are going to be on our neighborhoods and on our city and region. So join us at 6 next Wednesday, and in two weeks, we'll be discussing this very important case again. 